But we're going to start in with Dr. Mohammed Haji Mukhtar. He's a professor of uh, African and Middle Eastern history at the University of Savannah, basically. And mashallah, he's here to talk to us about the memorable moments in Somali history. This is something that's very important and dear to my heart because if we don't know our history, we will never be able to grow and learn from our mistakes. So let's give a round of applause for Dr. Muhammad Haji Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, sister. Uh, and thank, really, the organizer of this gathering. I'm so proud of these young people, men and women, who put uh, their time and their money and their everything uh, to make uh, this powerful and hopefully successful gathering for us Somalis as well as non-Somalis. Uh, I'm very happy to participate with you guys uh, in this event. Um, and I, as the sister said, I will probably try to uh, draw certain lights on some things that uh, since we lately, uh, we have little thing really to be proud of when we are dealing with other people, whether in Canada or in America or wherever we are, and indeed we are in many places in the world. So I, I will draw certain things that I learned from my own children when they were going to school, how they were humiliated when they were dealing with their classmates. I have three kids, I raised three kids in America, when they were in high school and their geography and history classes and textbooks, they used to come back asking me about uh, <clears throat> when it comes to Somalia, there are so many NAs. Who is the Somali president? Either it's NA or so many presidents. How about Somali capital city? There is either NA or several capital cities. When it comes to economy, there is either NA or several sources. So I used to have a hard time to explain to them those things uh, so that they will still, regardless of lack of those information, they, sh they should be proud of where they came from. And it's not easy, really, because every other kid will tell them, hey, I'm from Guatemala. Guatemala, the capital city is Guatemala City, and my president is so-and-so, and they can tell clearly. But my son and my daughter, they cannot explain about Somalia, uh, and they cannot convince their own kids. As you probably have seen my name, or under my name, I'm teaching African history. One of the most challenging uh, subjects to teach, when I'm teaching with my American kids, uh, when we are in Nigeria, we we will be always in good terms when we are in Ghana, Senegal, wherever we go. The day we come to Somalia, my students and I are going to be in, in difficulties. Because A, they know that I am from Somalia, from Somalia, and I can really teach Somalia better than another American professor or any non-Somali professor. But really my challenge was like my kids who are at school, I become in my university where I cannot convince my American students. Um, because um, to convince them, you have to have some facts, you have to have some, something convincing. Um, so it's very hard. Uh, we're all into this kind of predicament, and we're all living into that kind of situations. Uh, so I would like to maybe, we are not the first community in the world that are undergoing through these tough times, through these challenging times, through these very, very rough times uh, where even our identity is not identifiable. We are not the first people, you know. Everywhere in the world, most communities of the world, they have been there. They have been some challenging times. So probably, uh, uh, when they want to address what is this challenge and how we can really recover from it, you will always hear, say, the Europeans. The Europeans, 14th, 15th century, when they found themselves there in dark ages, 
Uh, they said, how we can get out of these dark ages? Everybody's doing good. Muslims are doing good. Asians are doing good. Why is Europe it is in this dark age? So they went back to uh, probably uh, the Greco-Roman traditions. You know, there was one day that we were the best in the world, the Greeks, the fountainhead of Western civilization, the Romans. Uh, so they went back to the Roman and Greek time, and they studied, and they had what they call the Renaissance. Uh, so the Renaissance revived, and in fact, it is rebirth, right? Renaissance is rebirth. Europe became back again and become dominant power in the world by just going back to their history. Very often, these days, the Muslims, you hear about them, when they find that they are in really, in really tough predicament. So the only answer they will give you is, hey, how about if you go back to the time of the prophet? We think that was the good time, the heydays of Islamic history. Let's go back to the, the caliphate. We hear lately in the Middle East, some people who was calling ISIL or ISL, they want to say, we want to reestablish the Islamic caliphate because that was the golden age of Islam. Every community, they have to go back to somewhere where they, where, they, where they can reconstruct and rebuild and then recover. The Christians, whenever they are in trouble, they will tell you, okay, let's go back to the basic. The basics is where we can build up uh, all of these things. So I'll give you a couple of uh, uh, back to history and if we can learn something uh, uh, from our past. I was told, of course, I don't have much time. I was penalized because I was supposed to be the first speaker of the night, but since I was not here at that time, so I lost some of my time. Um, but I will try to make <coughs> as short as I can be. So I give you one, two, three, maybe four scenarios or s points, what I call turning points of our history, if we go back, so that our young men and women, or even our Somali who maybe don't know about that, they could feel maybe better than they are today and they could share with their neighbors, with their friends, how Somali uh, are proud, proud people. As we all are aware, the whole, African, the whole Africa, the continent, was really, uh, have undergone through all kinds of tough times. It was the science of archaeology that freed Africa. Archaeology in the beginning of the last century found out that, in fact, Africa is the origin of man. That's where whole humanity and community evolved from. Whether you are black, brown, white, uh, that is the place. That is the fountainhead. That is the origin of man. And I looked at that issue. In fact, the area that they are talking about, that it is the origin of man, and we have evidence showing that it is true is where we came from. It is Somalia, it is southern Ethiopia, it is Djibouti, it is northern Kenya, where they found all these artifacts, all these uh, skeletons, all of these ancient things. Than, uh, so what is better to be proud of being the origin of man? We can tell my, uh, you can tell your Canadian friends and everybody, American, you know, Somalia is where uh, where history started. Um, and there are enough evidence for that. Uh, another uh, uh, issue, Somalia's uh, uh, Islam. Islam, although it is in a tough time today, uh, if we really study how Islam spread to Africa, how Islam spread throughout the rest of the world, and we know the role of Somalis in that issue, you wonder really uh, how great Somali Muslims were there in the old days. Um, Islam, in fact, there's a cliche which says, Somalis adopted Islam before Medina, the headquarters of Islam. How that happened? Islam grew from Mecca and then migrated to Medina but how then Islam can come to Somalia before even went to Medina? I think you need to read Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, all these great historians of Islam who wrote about the seerah of the Prophet, Asira Nabawiya, and it tells you that there are 
So a couple of migrations, two of them are very significant, which are known as Al-Hijra Al al-Habasha. Who knows who is Habasha? What was Habasha those days? This migration came to the Horn of Africa. And in fact, simply because that Somalis are predominantly Islamic or 100% Muslim, it shows is that could have been the landing places of Islam. Otherwise, in today's Ethiopia, today's Eritrea, today's uh, other countries in the Horn, they are not as Islamic as Somalis. So one can argue that, in fact, we were those who, in fact, spread Islam where the, the prophet, peace be upon him, felt. In fact, this hadith says uh, uh, that in, in, in that place in Abyssinia, there is people who are righteous. Righteous people. So if from then we spread Islam through the rest of the continent all the way to where even today is Central Africa, Southern Africa. So I think that is another point that we can be proud of it to not only the Africans, but to the whole Islamic world. We are the spreaders of Islam. Uh, the third thing I would like to uh, probably maybe point here tonight that we can be proud of it. Uh, when we come to closer history, Somali resistances against colonialism. I think uh, there are no many places in the world, forget about Africa, uh, that colonial powers partitioned, scrambled uh, like Somalia. You know, we had former French Somaliland, British Somaliland, Italian Somaliland, uh, uh, three European powers and lost territories to some of our neighboring countries, Ethiopia and Kenya. There's no other country in the continent that has been partitioned like that. And then the responses that we made, we again set example of fighting against all of these colonial powers, and we were very successful in defeating them. So what is more really being proud of being an example of the Africans when we talk about African resistances, Somalia will be the top, those who resisted colonial powers. Uh, another quick thing I would like to also draw your attention is fighting not only uh, against colonialism, but leading the independence banner. Uh, Somalis, we led the Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to be the first country or part of the first uh, African country to be independent. In 1949, 1949 uh, there is a United Nations resolution saying Somalia, part of Somalia, former Italian Somaliland, to be independent within 10 years. This resolution was 1949. So it was the what, did, what draw the attention of all Africans? They all Africans are saying, okay, if Somalia can be independent within 10 years, why not us? Why not me? Why not us? In fact, 1960, in the history of Africa, is known as the year of Africa. It is we who started, and many African countries following our footsteps, they got their independence in 1960, 61, and 62, 63. So that's why that year, the 60s deserves to be in the year of Africa. And we were those who led this independence drive. And another thing also we need to be proud of it is that until today, there are no African nation who was so partitioned, who was so divided, who in fact not only got independence, but unified two different colonial territories. Most Africans failed in that. They still maintained the status quo of the colonial uh, lines. But Somalia in 1960 was uh, so successful that they put two different colonial uh, regions under one Somali republic. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there are so many turning points in, in our history that it is only up to us to learn 
to teach our young people and to also uh, debate and discuss so that those lessons, we can draw something out of it. Uh, and then probably we will not be in this predicament of a kind where we feel shy and shame of ourselves that, oh, Somalis, these are those who have no state, uh, stateless society. The Somalis, they are the terrorists. The Somalis, they are the, uh, tell me, the pirates. The Somalis are this and that. If we go back to, uh, to our history, in fact, this is going to be helping us, helping us so that we can, in fact, build a better future for our near, uh, near future. The more we know about our, uh, about our history, the better we can come with a better uh, uh, conclusions and resolutions. And in fact, history is going to be teaching us to avoid all these mistakes that we are repeating you know, constantly. For the last 25 years, we hear that Somalis are trying to reconcile, to rehabilitate, to rebuild their own nation. But the way they are, the formula that they're using is the same thing that brought the country down, the nation down, why they are not changing those things. It's simply because they are ignorant about history. They are not aware about history because how you can really, it's only an idiot, sorry to say, the, to use the word, because that was what Einstein used. Einstein said, uh, defining an idiot, he said, it is the one who tries to make some, uh, re uh, to resolve something and repeats the same things over again and again and again and expect better results. That is what Einstein said, an idiot. Somalis are doing the same idiotic things. They are doing to make some, to arrive to some good situation, but they are repeating those same mistakes. We can learn from our latest reconciliations, for instance, that Somalis, for the first time in our history, that in 2003, we heard that Somalis have more than one language. I was so proud and happy of hearing that. What is better than being a multicultural, multilingual society? This is something that we found out before we were avoiding, we were saying no, we, were, we are mono everything, monolithic, monolingual, mono, 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 mono. In fact, you cannot convince your friends if you are so monolithic, how you can do, if you're all Muslims, how you can rape your sister, if you're all Muslims, how you can kill your brother. That, there must be some differences. So therefore, I'm so happy that we also build on those good things that Somalis are right now driving into, and we push into this multilingual, multicultural society like we are, in fact, appreciating in Canada and America. And thank you very much.